Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture in our ECG course. Our lecture today is called ECG Terminologies and here we are going to cover specific terminologies in ECGs that are important to be familiar with in our clinical practice regarding ECG interpretation. The first terminology that we are going to discuss is one of the very important terminologies that is important to understand a phenomenon called our wave progression. We are going to start with something called transition zone. The transition zone is a precorded lead at which the R wave becomes more than or equal S wave amplitude. So it is the precorded lead in which R S ratio is more than or equal 1. Normally it should be at V3 or V4 that in most normal conditions that you will find that transition zone in one of these two leads. So this is called the transition zone. According to understanding the transition zone, we can understand an important phenomenon called R wave progression. The so R wave progression, it means a progressive increase in the R wave amplitude in precorded leads. So normally, for example, R S ratio in V1 is less than 1 and then it is more than 1 in V6. So this is a normal R wave progression that we have seen before in the ECG interpretation. And also we have seen this phenomenon is the Schimper lane ECG rules. Then we have another phenomenon on the contrary, which is called poor R wave progression. And from its name, the transition zone is delayed in this patient till V5 or V6. So this means that the R S ratio remains less than 1 in all precordial pre leads till V5 or V6. And usually it occurs in patients with structural heart disease. So, for example, here we can see an example of normal R wave progression in which the transition zone here is in V4. Because in V1, 2, 3, R S ratio is still less than 1, but in V4, R wave becomes longer, or I'm sorry, taller than S wave, and so the transition zone here is at V4, so this is normal R wave progression. And here we have another example of poor R wave progression in which the transition is delayed till V6. As the first lead that you can see the R wave or is more than or equal to the S wave is in V6. So here is an example of poor R wave progression. So in order to understand this, we can create another two terminologies in ECG, which is delay transition zone. And this means that the transition zone is at V5 or V6. And this means poor R wave progression, as we see in the previous example. And early transition zone, in which the transition zone may be at V1 or V2. So a patient can have transition zone at V2, or sometimes V1 itself has tall R wave and this is an example that has a long differential diagnosis list. So at this time, we can call this early transition zone. Of course, many of us heard about this term, which is clockwise rotation and counterclockwise rotation. Clockwise rotation, it means simply delay transition zone beyond V4 or V5. And counterclockwise is early transition zone at V1 or V2. To be honest with you, we can use the previous two terms, early transition zone, delayed transition zone, poor R wave progression, or like we can sometimes call it early transition zone and that or the R wave progression is accelerated at V1 or V2, but we usually call it early transition zone. But why do we use these two terms? To be honest, they are usually written in literature, but we need to understand where did they come from? Where did the term clockwise and counterclockwise rotation come from? Let's expect here that we are looking at a patient from his foot and so you can see here that his chest on the top side of the slide and his back was on the bottom side of the slide and on your left hand, on your right hand side you can find the left side of the patient and on your left hand side you can find the right side of the patient. So imagine that you are looking at the patient who is lying on a bed from his foot and now we can see a transverse section in his heart and we can see the chest lead from V1 to V6 arranged in their anatomical places. Here we can see that there is normal R wave progression because as we see R wave starts small in V1 and then it gets taller and taller till it reach V6 it is taller than S wave and the transition zone here is nearly at V4 because at V4 we can see that that R wave is taller than S wave. What about here? For example, some patient may have something called counterclockwise rotation in which maybe anatomically the right heart is slightly shifted towards the right side as we seen here. So we can expect that the transition zone in this case will be slightly earlier. And so we can call this early transition zone. And as the heart is rotated in the counterclockwise rotation as we seen here, so we call this counterclockwise rotation. Let's see the opposite here. 
For example, some patient may have a heart rotated to the left side slightly, or sometimes it may be due to pulmonary hypertension or due to sometimes when the LV is dilated. So we can see here that the transition zone would be delayed till V5, and so we can call this delayed transition zone or poor R wave progression as we mentioned before, and we can call it clockwise rotation because it is a rotation direction of the rotation of the heart in this example so counterclockwise rotation refers to the early transition zone and clockwise rotation refers to the delayed transition zone so this is another example of the counterclockwise rotation and the clockwise rotation sometimes we can find these two terminologies in mcq questions and so we need to be familiar with although we usually use the term poor r wave progression delayed transition zone or early transition zone let's move to another example for example when we see a t wave in the ecg we discuss the normal rules for ECG, for T wave in ECG interpretation lecture. And we talked about the amplitude of the T wave, the asymmetry of the T wave, the duration, its relation to the complex when it is positive and when it is negative. But there is important terminology to understand in T wave, which will be, will be very important for you, especially if you are specializing in electrophysiology, which is the duration from the T wave peak to the T wave end. First of all, the peak of the T wave represents epicardial repolarization, and the base of the T wave represents endocardial repolarization near the end of T wave. If we measure the duration from the peak of T wave till the end of the T wave, this duration is called transmural dispersion of repolarization. Because this duration, it represents the difference between the repolarization in the epicardium and the endocardium. And the longer the duration, it's like acting as a substrate for re-entrant circuit inside the myocardium, which is something that's spinning intramyocardially because of the difference between the voltage in the epicardium and the endocardium due to the longer duration between here and here. And so when patients have long TDR, which is present in patients with long QT syndrome, this increases the susceptibility to VT and of course to tursat de point, which can cause sudden cardiac death. And so in patients with long QT syndrome, when you have a wide based T wave, this is maybe may considered a high risk sign for tursat de point in patients with long QT syndrome. And we call this interval transmural dispersion of repolarization. Of course, we discussed before the correct QT interval, so I will come to it just in short. We know that, of course, we know the actual QT interval starts from the start of the complex till the end of the T wave. And so we mentioned that QT interval contains two intervals, two, two, two waveforms, the QRS complex and the T wave. But we mentioned that the QT interval is dynamic and is affected by the heart rate. As the slower the heart rate, the longer the QT interval and vice versa. And so we need to correct the QT interval to the heart rate. The most common formula, of course, as we mentioned before, the passes formula, in which the correct QT interval equal QT divided by the square root of RR interval. RR our interval would be would be in seconds while QT interval would be in milliseconds. QT dispersion is a terminology that you will find in a lot of literature in a lot of clinical trials and papers which discuss the difference between the longest QT interval in the surface ECG and the shortest QT interval on the same surface ECG. So for example in this example we can see that the minimal QT interval is in EVL, while the maximum QT interval was in V3. So the longer the QT dispersion, as the longer or the larger the difference between the longest QT interval and the shorter the shortest QT interval, the more the risk of developing to set the point. Because this means that, of course, there is a substrate for re-entry in this patient because there is a voltage difference between different sites in the heart. Because as we know that the ECG lead each one of them look at a, diff a certain portion of the heart. And so when this duration or the difference between the longest and shortest QT interval is higher, this means that there is a large voltage difference and large difference in conduction velocity which can act as a substrate for re-entry and so a lot of papers discuss the relation or correlation of QT dispersion with risk of sudden cardiac death in patients with long QT syndrome. Then we are going to have another terminology which is P wave dispersion. It's the same as the QT dispersion as it discusses the difference between the duration of the longest P wave and the shortest P wave on the 12 lead surface ECG. But here the larger the difference, the higher the risk of 
atrial fibrillation because when there is a long diff large difference between longest P wave and shortest P wave this predictor of interatrial and intraatrial electrical delay and this means that there is remodeling inside the atrium that has taken place for a long time and this increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation so QT dispersion increased the risk of torsade de poids especially in patients with long QT syndrome P wave dispersion increased risk of atrial fibrillation so both have the same idea of the difference between the longest and shortest value. Then we have the heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is a measure that is present in Holter ECG, not in the surface ECG, as it is a variation of heart rate throughout the whole day, which is measured in the Holter ECG. And this is considered like a normal phenomena that is an independent predictor of cardiac mortality if it is reduced. What does this mean? It means that in normal conditions there should be heart rate variability throughout the whole day. And when this variability is reduced or diminished, this is a sign of worse prognosis. And so in patients with elderly dysfunction, heart rate variability is decreased, and this may increase the risk of worse adverse cardiac outcomes on the long run. So heart rate variability is a physiological phenomenon that should be present in normal individuals and reduce variability along the whole day is a bad sign. And of course, as we understand, heart rate variability reflects the innervation of the heart, the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. And so its reduction is, of course, a worse sign regarding cardiac prognosis. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia, of course, is one of the famous terminologies that we heard from the undergraduate learning. It means that there is an increase in the heart rate with inspiration and decrease in the heart rate with expiration. And so respiratory sinus arrhythmia is not a pathological phenomenon. It is a physiological phenomenon in which the heart rate is variable with the cycles of breathing. And in order to put it in your mind or not to forget, remember, I for increase, I for inspiration. So increase heart rate with inspiration and decrease with expiration. And so respiratory sinus arrhythmia is a normal variant that you should not consider something abnormal. And of course, don't misdiagnose this ECG as that the patient has PECs because if it was PECs, P wave morphology should be different in the PEDs that comes earlier than expected. But here the P wave morphology is the same. So this is sinus rhythm. Despite irregularity, it is still sinus rhythm, but the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is a physiological phenomenon, and so it is sinus rhythm, not PECs. And of course, respiratory sinus arrhythmia is an index of cardiac vagal function, and it is a physiological phenomenon that represents respiratory circular interaction. Then we have another phenomenon that is uncommon to be seen, or some Cardiologists consider it rare, but if it is seen, of course, it is something very dangerous, which is the T wave alternance. T wave alternance is a periodic peak to peak variation in the amplitude, polarity, or shape of the T wave during sinus rhythm. So, for example, you can see that the T wave is taller and then shorter, taller and then shorter on coincident peaks, or sometimes positive and negative, positive and negative in the same strip of ECG lead. So, I'm talking here about single patient single ECG lead in the same ECG the patient had variation in T wave so it is not something related to ischemia because some people may consider that this happens in myocardial ischemia but no I'm talking about a strip of ECG that you see alternating variation in the shape or polarity of the T wave and of course if I saw this sign in the ECG this means that there is non-homogeneity in myocardial refractoriness and of course as we mentioned in the QT dispersion and as we mentioned before it's a transmural dispersion of repolarization. This sign is also a bad prognostic sign in patients with long QT syndrome and can be considered a high risk sign for developing malignant ventricular arrhythmia, especially to reset the poids and increasing risk of sudden cardiac death. So this patient is considered a high risk for sudden cardiac death and this may alter, of course, the management plan if I saw this ECG sign. So this is called T-wave alternance. And now we are going to discuss another terminology, which is the secondary repolarization abnormalities, or sometimes it's called ST2 wave abnormalities. Secondary repolarization abnormality from its terminology is something related to abnormality in the repolarization mean of the ventricle, of course. And here we mean ST depression, we mean T wave inversion, we mean as well QT prolongation, and sometimes the early repolarization or the early takeoff. And as we mentioned in the terminology, secondary. So this 
this word means that it is secondary to another pathology in the heart. Like what? Like, for example, left boundary branch block, right boundary branch block, left ventricular and right ventricular hypertrophy, manifest pre-excitation, structural heart disease like an arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy and electrolyte disorders. So, for example, here in patients with left boundary branch block, which of course would be discussed in a separate lecture, we can find that there is T wave inversion here, for example, in V6 with slight ST depression, and also in V5 there is minimal ST depression. This is called secondary repolarization abnormality with left bundle, and so it is secondary to the left bundle itself. For example, also in right bundle branch block, we can find that there is T wave inversion in V1, V2, V3, and maybe extending also to the left precordial leads, and so we can call them secondary polarization abnormality secondary to the right bundle. In manifest pre-excitation, as we saw here, we can see that there is T wave inversion and ST depression in the inferior leads and also in V5 and V6, and so we can call them secondary repolarization abnormality as they are secondary to the manifest pre-excitation or dwarf Parkinson White syndrome. So this is a broad terminology that is used with a lot of disorders in cardiology to describe abnormality in the ST segment or T wave due to a primary pathology in the heart. Dominant R wave in EVR is one of the terminologies that is mentioned a lot in literature and has a list of differential diagnoses. We know, of course, from the ECG interpretation lecture and also from the ECG axis and from the Chamberlain ECG rules that EVR should be negative regarding P wave, complex, and T wave. So when I found, find a dominant R wave in EVR, this means that this patient has an abnormality that I should try to understand what's the reason for it. It can be used caused by a number of diseases. One of them is not a disease itself. It is not just like a mistake in the lead attachment. It's called limb lead reversal, which we are going to discuss in normal variants. Sodium channel blocking drugs, like for example, tricyclic angiopresin toxicity, may lead to dominant R wave in EVR. Dextrocardia may also lead to the same condition because the axis of the heart is not directed away from the posterior pulmon EVR. No, it is perpendicular to EVR, so it may show a biphasic complex. And sometimes in ventricular tachycardia, of course, because the rhythm is coming from a focus in the ventricle, so it may go towards EVR itself. And so in this condition, EVR may be positive. Now we came to the end of our lecture. So let's recall what we understood today. We understood what's meant by R wave progression, and from this terminology, we understand the transition zone in the ECG precordial leads, and we understood as well clockwise and counterclockwise rotation, and what is the reason for this terminology. We understood the corrected QT interval, which we discussed before in the ECG interpretation lecture. We understood QT dispersion, which is important to be oriented with patient with long QT syndrome. We understood P wave dispersion, which is important predictor for developing atrial fibrillation. We understood respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is considered a physiological phenomena. We understood heart rate variability, which is also a physiological phenomena that we see in Holter ECG. We understood T wave alternance, which is a rare sign to be seen, but if you saw it, you should consider it as a grave sign. We understood secondary depolarization abnormalities, which involve abnormality in the ST and T waves occurring with certain car uh, cardiac disorders. And finally, we understood the dominant R wave in AVR. Thank you very much for your listening.